All right, we're going to be in John chapter 2 today. We're going to somewhat finish up John chapter 2. I actually would have had to have a few more questions to totally finish it, and I knew we probably wouldn't get there. So uh, anyway, uh, so let's uh, start reading in verse 13, and uh, we'll read down through the end of the chapter. So starting verse 13 says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And He told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make My Father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume Me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now I want to, um, before I read the last couple of verses, verse uh, 21 and 22, uh, John has the benefit here of writing these in hindsight. So he's not writing this as this occurs, so he writes, and notice what he says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. John probably didn't pick that up at the moment that Jesus said it. It's in hindsight that he realizes what Jesus was saying, and he's able to write it now because he wrote this 25 years after it actually occurred. And then verse 22, of course, gives us that understanding as well. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. In other words, hindsight looking back, they remembered these events, and they started all coming together for them. But in the moment that it happened, they're taking it in. You can imagine they were just as surprised as the other people that he's doing this in the temple. So uh, they were taking it all in. But he writes that somewhat in hindsight. Verse 23, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, uh, let's back up and uh, let's start walking through some of this. If you look at your questions, we're going to use those to, to kind of start our discussions. Uh, why did Jesus choose to go up to Jerusalem? What was Passover? Was the Passover a ceremonial holiday, a spiritual remembrance? Do we have anything in our lives like this today? So let's kind of digest those statements. Uh, why did Jesus? Why did Jesus? Why did Jesus choose? To go up to Jerusalem? Or did he choose? Celebrate, celebrate Passover. Mm -hmm. Was it a choice he made? Requirement. He was a Jewish man. All Jewish men were required to go up to the temple <laughs> most believe three times a year. Uh, this was one of them, Passover feast was one of them and they were to bring a sacrifice and a temple tax when they did. Now Jesus, as we know, there were times that He did not go along with their ritualistic laws. And when I say ritualistic, that would be not God-given law, but things they had implemented themselves. Or He defined them in a different way than what they were looking at them. But we notice here He does go up, which this was a, this was a God thing. Establishing Passover. Passover was a remembrance of what? The Exodus. Partly the Exodus out of Egypt and the death angel and the passing over and all. Yeah. So, right, if you remember, the last plague was the death angel that would come. And if they took the blood of a lamb, painted on their doorpost, then the death angel would pass over their home, would not kill the firstborn. But all those who did not do that, firstborn died. So this was a remembrance that God actually established right after that, after they left Egypt. God established, 
you will observe Passover every year. It will be a reminder of what God had done for them. So, <clears throat> was Passover a ceremonial holiday or a spiritual remembrance? Now, let's answer that out of two different perspectives. One is, was it originally established as a ceremonial holiday or a spiritual remembrance? Originally established, it was a spiritual remembrance. What had it become? Ceremonial holiday. Do we have any? Um, do we have any? ceremonial holidays that um, that we that were established by God for us to observe established by God yeah Lord supper yeah and when is it supposed to occur April <laughs> 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 what's the uh, what's the time that God gives for, or Christ actually said it right? Jesus is the one who said it. What, what's the time that He gives for it to occur? As often as you do it, yeah. He doesn't establish a day. He doesn't establish a time. He just says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So there are, and we know this. There are denominations that choose to do it every Sunday. Nothing wrong with that. But as often as they do it, it better be in remembrance of them. In other words, it can't become a ceremonial holiday that loses its meaning. Um, Y'all know that, that we do it at least once a year. Uh, this year will be twice. We're going to have uh, communion the Sunday before Thanksgiving, that Sunday morning service. We'll have communion. We're not going to do foot washing. We're just going to have communion that morning. Um, but so we'll have it twice this year because we've done it once at um, Passover Sunday. So we have to remember too uh, the real re the real meaning behind what we are doing and not become um, just excited that we're doing something we don't normally do. If that, if that makes sense, we have to remember what it's truly about. Do we have any other? things that are established as spiritual remembrances. <clears throat> okay. I'm just asking the question. How about the rainbow? Ah, the rainbow possibly could be a uh, a spiritual remembrance. It's not necessarily designed to a day. Uh, it is just when we see it, what are we supposed to remember? That he will never flood the earth. We're supposed to remember the flood. That he will never flood the earth again. Yeah, yeah. See? Don't remember that people drown. Remember he's not going to do it again. He's true to his promise. Yeah. Set yourself up. <laughs> she does it often. Um, you think Easter and Christmas both is supposed to be a spiritual remembrance? Supposed to be. Is uh, and that's where you know I had thrown in there when I first asked the question established by God, because really the Christmas, as we know it today, was not established as you need to celebrate this Easter. Um, you might could say the resurrection, because uh, we worship on the day of the resurrection. We don't worship on the Sabbath anymore. We worship on the first day of the week, which is when he arose. So you might could say that the resurrection would also be one that dates back to the time that it actually occurred. The observing of the rainbow dates back to when it actually occurred. God gave that uh, promise then. Uh, the um, Lord's Supper communion also goes back to when Christ actually did it, and He says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of Me. But when we look at things that we typically think about today as maybe even being somewhat spiritual, 
uh, Christmas was established really by man. Uh, Easter, as we know it today, was somewhat established by man in terms of the celebration that we do. Now, the, the service obviously is, is a spiritual remembrance. Um, what about some of the other things? How about the day the, the earth stood still and the sun stood still for a battle to... And it was a good story with that because they said NASA was going to shoot a rocket off one time. They couldn't get the mathematics right until they added that in. Right. That it was, uh, that it actually did occur. Right. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of things today that are ceremonial holidays. Christmas is one of them. And it has become more of just a holiday. Now, there are people hopefully us, that actually remember what we're really trying to do with it, and that's remember the birth of the Savior that came to the earth. Was it actually on December 25th? Yeah, we don't really know. Probably not, but we don't really know. Uh, so it's a day that was just chosen to, to set aside as that day. Uh, there's a lot of other days, if, if you look just from a, a perspective of even why was July 4th established? Now, there's no spiritual meaning behind that, unless maybe you would say that God was behind the establishing of the country. But, but in terms of just, you know, July 4th, do we really remember it for what it truly was? Or has it got somewhat watered down even today? Um, you know, as it was a truly established, it was because there were a lot of people that had gave their life for the independence of this country. And today we shoot off fireworks, and we don't really know why we shoot them off. You ask a kid, why are you shooting off fireworks? What do you think their answer would be? To annoy my neighbor. <laughs> to annoy my neighbor. <laughs> don't you think, though, that July the 4th is more ceremonial than Christmas anymore? Because Christmas has gotten where it's strictly gifts for me, gifts for me. Like Black Friday. Yeah, it depends on the the person, probably. I mean, it <clears throat> it's hard to know. If you looked at the United States overall, there is still a lot of people. I don't know what the percentage would be, but I would say there would be half that would, if you questioned them, like truly questioned them, why do we observe Christmas? They would probably come up with the answer of, like, it was Christ's birthday. But in what they do... And, and let's be honest, like we've probably lost sight sometimes as well of December 25th. And we get wrapped up in watching grandkids or kids open presents and we kind of forget the real meaning behind that. And um, so, I mean, even we can, can do that sometimes. So we have to be careful with that. But, um, but a lot of things tend, the reason I bring this up, a lot of things tend to go away from their original meaning unless we hold a hard line of this is why it's established and we pass it from generation to generation and we teach it generation to generation. It's one of the. young people now don't know why we celebrate Fourth of July. Right. They, some of them may not. Um, some of the other, here's two holidays that get really mixed up. Labor Day and Memorial Day. How many of you have been guilty of, don't, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think about it, have been guilty of saying Memorial Day in September and Labor Day in May and get the two flip-flopped or can forget which one's which. Those two seem to be the two that we get confused. Two totally different days that were set aside and meanings that were set aside. And yet another one is Veterans Day. Memorial Day and Veterans Day. It's two different days. Two different groups of people. Thanksgiving Day. <clears throat> yeah. I never can remember which Thursday it's supposed to be on. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What, yeah. what day of the... <laughs> yeah. You know, um, right. to really question why we have Thanksgiving, once the farm community kind of somewhat dissipated, some of the meaning of that was lost just because the community changed. Thanksgiving was originally, the thought was that God has sustained us through this year and has provided enough food for us to be able to live, just to survive, and they were giving thanks for that. Uh, we've lost some of that. 
even even though we're kind of in a farm community, we've still lost some of that. A lot of it. Yeah. It's more known as a turkey day now. Yeah. yeah. Or football day or, football yeah, football. you know. But all these been established by, the, by our government. Thanksgiving, Amen. Memorial Day, uh, Labor Day, mm -hmm. all of those. And they yeah. seem to draw more significance than the uh, birth of Christ and uh, the resurrection. Let's be honest, until... You know, was coming up with this, and uh, and I didn't even think about the rainbow one. But I mean, how many of us thought about that's something that God established for us to ceremonially remember as a spiritual um, remembrance? You know, I, I didn't think about you know every time I see it, really, I should stop and give thanks. And although I know that, like, do I do it? I'm too busy trying to find the end of it where that pot of gold's supposed to be. Right? <laughs> All right, question two. Uh, what does Jesus refer to the temple as in verse 16, and why would he do this? His father's house. Why would he refer to the temple as his father's house? Was this the same one that was brought along from the Old Testament? Yes and no. Uh, it was rebuilt, but Herod had made changes to it. So when they refer to this 60, what does it say, 60 what years? 46, sorry, 46 years. That 46 years was the changes that Herod made. So it had been rebuilt back in Old Testament times. Herod comes along, this is Herod the Great, comes along. And he starts adding to it and, and remodeling, we might say. And uh, so, uh, so it is a little bit different than what was in, in Old Testament. But still, the, the meaning of it was supposed to be the same. So why would Jesus make this statement? Was it his father's house? It was supposed to be. It was supposed to be, it was supposed to be where his father dwelt. It was God's presence among them. But why would Jesus make this statement? Because it's pretty bold, isn't it? I mean, that day and time to walk in, remember this is like the most treasured place for the Jewish community. Their existence revolved around Jerusalem, but the temple there in Jerusalem. So why would... I think he said it because they had lost the reverence. Okay. They had lost the reverence of it. Okay, so uh, he was, it was his initial statement to try and bring back the, the true meaning. My father's house, making that statement, God is my daddy. Right. I mean, in, in Respectfully, terms, right. Like my father's house became that, whoa, what did you just say? You're claiming to be the son of God. If you remember, they actually use this statement that he makes about rebuilding it, tear it down, I will rebuild it in three days. They use this statement against him when he stands trial. <laughs> three some odd years in the future. They use this statement against him, and they use it as an accusation. He said, if you tear the temple down, he said he would rebuild it in three days. He can't do that. So he makes a statement, and it's a statement of authority. This is my father's house. I'm here to establish it in the way it's supposed to be. Um, now, this would be um, heresy and blasphemy to many of the Jewish religious leaders because he's just state, made a statement that he was God, in essence, son of God. So Jesus does it and um, does it with a purpose. He's not just throwing it out there that, hey, y'all need to look at me and y'all need to put me on a pedestal. That's not why he's doing this. He's doing this to say, you've taken my father's house and made it be something it's not. I have the authority to change it back to what it should be. Therefore, give me just a minute to make up this whip, and then we're going to get down to business. And he did. Now, there is the other Gospels. Luke does not, or I'm sorry, John does not. The other Gospels record that he goes into the temple again prior to um, his uh, 
not long before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he goes in again and does the same thing because it went back to what it was. Uh, John doesn't, uh, if I'm remembering this right, John does not record that, but the other Gospels do. So there's two different times that we see. Kevin, was the, was the, veil, <clears throat> the veil and all was still there, the mm-hmm. curtains or whatever you want were yeah. still there when he was in there. Don't you think there was probably stuff going on that no one was allowed to be in that area and they were in that area? There was, if you flip over to the back, maybe a good place, uh, there's actually a picture of the temple on the back. And th- again, this is a, a man made drawing of it, so it's just a diagram, but it's close to what it would have been. Maybe not exact, but close. Okay. So if you look at that, you see, you know, Solomon's porch is on your right hand side. You've got the royal porch on the very bottom. And then inside that surrounding square, you find. Uh, labeled at the bottom, Court of Gentiles. This is where all of this was taking place, was the Court of Gentiles. Now, why was there a Court of Gentiles? They weren't Jews. They couldn't go in. They weren't Jews. They couldn't go all the way in, but they allowed them to go here. And this was an area that was established that they were supposed to be able to worship. So worship was supposed to be going on here. That's not what was going on here. Now, if you go a next step in, depending on which path you take, but if you'll notice on your right-hand side of kind of the next smaller square, you find on the bottom it's labeled Court of Women. The women could go a step further than the Gentiles could go. But then to the left of that, uh, you actually find the court of priests, and surrounding the court of priests, you find the court of Israel. That's the men of Israel could go a step beyond where the women could go. And then you have a place where the priest, the court of priests could actually go, and you find the altar that's there. And then you take a step further, and you find the holy place. And then the step beyond that, and this is what Don referenced, uh, if you see that most holy place, which is kind of all the way to the left there of that innermost uh, square, you see it labeled the most holy place. That's where the altar of God was. That's where the, the um, um, help me with it, the name of it. Ark of, Ark of the Covenant. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And um, that is theoretically and reality, that's where the presence of God resided among them. Now only one priest could go in there a year. Uh, you find differing views on this, but he did have... Uh, woven into his fabric that he wore. You did have uh, bells or, or things that would make noise, jingle kind of thing. And some say that, that he had a rope tied on his, his body, leg, arm, whatever. And so if he went in and he was sinful and had not repented of everything, then God would strike him dead. Instead of someone going in to get him because they would not, they would drag him out. Now that's some say that's the way it happened. Some say it did not happen that way. Uh, but at any rate, it was an area where you had better be right to go in there as that priest of that year. So um, we find that, that just the ability to go, and oh, what I was going to say too, what Don mentioned about the veil, that veil was between the most holy place and then the holy place. And that's where the veil would be. And only that priest could go beyond that, that veil for that year. So these were Gentiles selling doves and all that for sacrifice, right? These were probably Jews selling to Gentiles and Jewish people. Mm-hmm. Um, religion had taken a turn toward business in their world. Imagine that. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it was probably more Jewish people that were taking advantage of people that were traveling in. I'm not going to say, but they would have kept Gentiles out because they would not have wanted them to make any money off of Jewish people. So they would have probably kept Gentiles out from doing any kind of business there. So Jesus say, says, it's my Father's house. You know, something that would have been interesting, it's not in Scripture anywhere that I know of. <laughs> But it would have been interesting to think about if Jesus would have walked into the temple and just kept walking all the way up to the most holy place. Walked in, sat down, and talked with God. 
I've never thought about it. I don't think it's anywhere in Scripture that I can think of. If any of you find it, let me know. But um, it would be interesting if he would have done that, walked in and sat down, and what their reaction would have been. That would have probably been too much for them to take in at that moment in time. Probably would have changed everything. They would have seen him then as who he, well, some of them would have seen him as who he truly was. It would have been hard not to see him as who he truly was. And so... Um, as far as we know, it did not happen. Question three, why were they selling animals in the temple? What led to this? What was God's original instruction for individuals concerning the animal they would offer as a sacrifice? So every year they had to bring a sacrifice that they would, they would um, kill there on the altar. Um, and this was per family that they would do. So uh, why were they selling animals in the temple? Yeah, so a lot of people, as we said earlier, every Jewish male was supposed to travel in for this time. That was a week-long celebration. Passover was one day. Feast of Unleavened Bread was the entire week. But this all happened together. So it was kind of two things all working together. So they were required to travel in. Now there is some uh, reports and, and theologians that have studied, historians I guess you'd say, that when Passover week happened, there would be over a million people that would be camped and in tents around the outside of Jerusalem, camping, because they had traveled in. There was no place for them to stay inside Jerusalem. It was full, and so they would just pitch a tent on the outside around, around Jerusalem. Some say it would be up to a million people that would be there, especially if they brought their families in you know, with them, and some would. They would travel with their family. Some, the man would just go, the, the male, the head of the household would just go. But uh, a lot of things were family oriented. And you think about if you've got a young son, especially, you want to begin training him in those ways, so you would probably bring him. So anyway, there's a lot of people that came in, and they would travel great distance to do that. So to bring an animal with them, you'd have to make sure you brought feed, you had place, you know, water for them, all this kind of stuff. It, it's like packing an infant almost, except it's an animal and you got to take care of them some way. So what happened was, now this was not established by God that I can find, but the priest somewhere along the way said, okay, for those that are traveling a long way in, why don't we um, have animals here that they can buy and that they can use as sacrifice so that they don't have to try and bring one in? Probably the guy that had the original thought, I'm going to give him credit and say it was with best of intention that he had this thought. Whether it was or not, I don't know. He could have been looking and saying it's a money-making scheme, let's do this. I want to say that he had the best of thought with it and he was trying to make it easier for these people that would be traveling in. So... Let's, let's speculate how it would have possibly started. Maybe he says, let's set this up on the road on the way into Jerusalem. And so from that point, it gets set up there, and then it starts inching over time, starts inching a little bit closer, a little bit closer to the temple. And then finally, someone says, why don't we move this inside the temple? Because we're going to be closer to where they actually need them anyway. And we'll just have them there. And... Because there were, we are so accustomed today to the American dollar. You know, we can go to almost any country, and the American dollar is is pretty accepted. Uh, that was not the case then. You had to pay the temple tax in the Jewish currency. Now, if you lived in some of these outlying areas, Jewish currency was not accepted. So you you had your own or their own currency for whatever area you lived in. So when you came here to the temple, you had to change your money into Jewish money in order to pay the temple tax. Well, you know what the opportunity was there, right? Money changers, which were different than the ones that were actually selling the animals, money changers said, you know, it cost us a little bit for you to be able to you know, swap this money out. So you know, we're going to charge you just a little bit of interest for, for changing your money. And then from that moment in time, it, it takes off. Then they said, 
you know, the money changers are sitting there in the temple. Why don't we move the animals in there? Because they're going to have to pay us in Jewish currency too. So if we're outside, then they're going to have to walk in to the court of Gentiles, get their money changed, and then they're going to have to walk back outside so that they can buy the animal from us in Jewish currency, and then they have to go back inside. So it's just going to be easier if we all set up in here, right? You see how that can happen, like over time, progression of that? Uh, what was God's original intention for individuals concerning the animal that they would offer as a sacrifice? Without a blemish. Without a blemish. So basically giving up the best they have for God. Yeah, go back to the, the time of Exodus. If you remember, they were supposed to bring that animal in their home. It was actually supposed to live with them, similar to a child. Some reports say that for months they would have it within the home. They became attached to it. It became like a pet. It was something that was dear to them that they would give up, and it was the best. It was without blemish. It was unspotted. Um, it was something that it hurt them to actually give up. You would have to explain to your child why we are about to kill this pet. Lucy, yeah, whatever the name is. It would be like a doodle that you had to get rid of at some point in time. Just saying. He's a teaching star meddling, didn't he? Yeah, he is. <laughs> it meant something to them. That was God's intention. You know why? Because our sin means something to God. <laughs> And so for us to understand what we put God through when we sin, then we have to understand what losing something actually means. When God lost, by, by willing choice of Adam and Eve, when He lost that relationship, it hurt Him. He lost something that He had. It hurt Him. And the only way for us to understand that is we have to, it has to hurt us a little bit sometimes. So that was the establishment here. Now Christ actually took that hurt to the cross, right? No longer do we do the sacrifice, no longer do we have that. But we've lost some of the understanding of that hurt because, as we say it sometimes, it's so easy to come to Christ. Reality is, it's a little bit difficult to come, but when we realize a true follower of Christ and what, what should be our life going forward... Um, so it's not as easy as just we walk up there and we say, hey, I want to accept Christ, and we walk away, and we're done. There's more to it, right? Yes. Our whole life should become a sacrifice. That's right. So it, we should be willing to give up whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, so his original instruction was, you're going to offer me the best you have, something that's near and dear to you. How did that fit in with this, I'm going to buy something right outside or inside now, the court of Gentiles? There's no loss. Yeah, it become, again, going back to question one, it was a ceremonial holiday. Right? The giving of gifts was established at Christmas because it was supposed to remind us of what the wise men brought to Christ. Now, what was the significance of the gifts that the wise men brought to Christ? They were, what were they? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What was the significance of those things? What was frankincense and myrrh used for? Perfume. They were perfumes used for burial. Something Christ would go through. What was the gold used for? Anybody? Um, uh, maybe, probably it was to fund the trip that he had to take to, down to Egypt to avoid being killed. So it was probably to fund his way is probably what it was actually used for by Mary and Joseph. So it was things that were 
valuable to what Christ was going to be dealing with in his life. When we give a gift today, do we even think back to like why gifts were first established and what they mean and, and why we should? It'd probably be a really good study to think about. We might do that closer to Christmas. To think about what the three gifts actually represented and mean. Um, so, you know, them buying this animal right outside the temple really meant nothing to them anymore. But we can see how that happens in our life too, right? We can buy a gift for someone. And even though we have good intentions with it and, and we want, but it really doesn't have the meaning that maybe it was first established to have. Question four then, what does the condition that the temple was in tell us about the condition of the Jewish nation at that point in time? What condition was the temple in? Now, let me just say, they had just spent 46 years, Herod had spent a lot of money, a lot of time on remodeling the place, right? So how did it look? Physically, it's good. Physical building looked great, right? We can have a great looking building today. But what was actually the condition of the Jewish nation and what was going on in the temple? It was getting sinful. It was very <laughs> sinful. It was broken to the core. It was ugly. It was, to sum it up with one word, that maybe we, it was sinful. And that was the state of the Jewish nation. They were far from God and what their original his original plan for them was. I saw the, uh, the guy that came through town several years ago that did the, the meeting of the Passover. It was uh, Jews for Jesus, I think it was the organization. Okay. And he said that I asked him the spiritual condition of Israel today, and he said they have never been per the least spiritual level they've ever been at. Yeah. It's non almost. It's like... Any of you seen this red heifer um, um, statement to delivering to Israel? Have any of you seen that? You're talking about the sacrifice? Mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been hearing about that for a long time. There's an article that, that came out uh, maybe a month ago, maybe not that long, a few weeks ago. Um, I think it was, they said seven or ten, I forget which one it was, red heifers that were born in Texas, supposedly. They are without spot and without blemish, supposedly. Supposedly been analyzed or examined by Jewish leaders. And they have been flown, supposedly, on a plane to Israel. And theoretically, what the article proclaims is that this means that true worship can now return because they have a unspotted, unblemished red heifer that they can now sacrifice, which means they now need the temple in their mind. They need the temple back. Some people are trying to say that this is like a sign of the return of Messiah. Here's the deal, though. Why did Christ come to this earth? To do away with what? Or to fulfill, I shouldn't say do away. To fulfill what? The whole sacrifice thing. Why would God then say, okay, I'm going to bring back everything you need to do sacrifice again? Because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, he was. So why, does, why would God need to do that, right? So just kind of take that with, understand that, that in Jewish culture that have not accepted Christ, going back to kind of what Wesley brought up, it does mean something to them because they've not accepted Christ as the ultimate sacrifice, which then tells us again the spiritual state of the Jewish nation, if that's where it's at. So um, don't get caught up in the red heifer's return, it means Christ is coming back kind of thing. We know reality, Christ can come back at any point in time. There is, if you want more information on that, there's a pretty good article on... Um, gotquestions.org, I believe it is, .com or .org, gotquestions.com or .org, either one. Well, there's a pretty good article on there about it that explains it all. And when you first start reading the article, it talks about 
like what it all means, why the Jewish nation, and then at the bottom it goes into the, what I just told you, like why do they need to reestablish that? Because Christ is the ultimate sacrifice, so there's no need for that to occur. And, and they're still missing the main thing. This had to mean something to the individual. That's right. And not just a, a group of people. That's, that's always been Israel's downfall. It's not a personal relationship. It, it is. It's, with them, it's not. But it should be a personal relationship. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, question five. And there is no way we're getting through 13, probably. Why would Jesus drive out the money changers, or why was there even money changers present? Now, I've already shared with you that, right? So why would he drive them out? Because they were taking advantage of people. Like, they were, they were stealing, and they were robbing. And where were they doing it? In a holy place. In a, what was supposed to be a holy place, and they're taking advantage of people. And they're taking advantage of people like this is happening in the court of Gentiles. They were preventing them from worshiping. So it wasn't just that they were taking advantage of people. They were actually preventing those. Let's set aside and let's, let's realize like there were some true worshipers, right? Like every single person that came to that temple was not there for the wrong reasons. There were some that were there for the right reasons. Kind of like today. Kind of like today. There were people that, that came and brought their animal sacrifice, that it was close to them, they cared about, there were people that were very intent on doing the right thing. They couldn't help that the, the Jewish religious system had got broken, but they were trying to follow what Old Testament law told them to do. So there were people trying to do this. And then they walk into the court of Gentiles, and what do they see around them? A carnival-like atmosphere is what they see. You ever wonder if that happens in church? And I'm not talking about just the service. I'm talking about church as a whole. There are people that truly want to come, learn, study, and worship God. And they walk in or they associate themselves with the church. And it's such a carnival-like atmosphere that does it really happen? And so we have to think about that in our, in our own life. Question six then, how would all of this contribute or take away from the worship that was supposed to occur. And I kind of got into that in my answer just a minute ago. So all of this was going on. Some were trying to truly worship. And they were, I mean, the whole point of them coming was just getting so convoluted and broken down by what was going on around them that it was almost impossible for them to worship as they truly should be. All right, question seven. If the original decision to allow the selling of animals around the temple was made truly out of trying to help people come to the temple, make it easier on those who were traveling great distances, was it a wrong decision to have allowed this? I think it was. It took the, it took the person out of the, you walk up, Say, yeah, I'll just take that goat right there. And okay. Then raise it. Kids don't love it. It's a whole lot easier to cut its throat than it would be a, this little lamb that we raised. Right. So. It wasn't with me every day. Sacrifice there. Okay. Why else would it be wrong? I'm sorry. Turned it to greed. Is that what? Profit involved. Profit involved. Yeah, money. Profit involved. Someone else said so. Donna, did you say? Yeah, I said that wasn't what God told me to do. That's the ultimate. God said, this is God established for them to, to raise it, have it in their home, be a personal thing like Don's talking about. Not a, a greed kind of thing, not a business deal. This is not a, a money making system. This is. God said this is the way it's supposed to be. Anything that's outside of that then is what? Is wrong. So ultimately, even though best of intention, right? I, I'm giving the guy credit that first came up with the idea, that he had the best of intention with this. You know what they say about good intentions? Go ahead, Wally. 
at the time, the Romans <laughs> had control of that country pretty much. There was a lot of revolutionary talk going on. People, the Jews hated the Romans at the time. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think that there might have been some influence in that regard as far as making this a little bit more easier. Praetorium, which was the Roman garrison, which was on the north west corner of the, tem of the, of the Temple Mount area that kind of gave them an opportunity to kind of oversee things going on there. It's got all these people from coming from different countries, areas of the can't help think that there's a little bit more influence. That one, you're talking about the one guy, I think that, that might be the one guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I say that, I'm just, what I mean by it is, like, I don't want to be so critical to say that he was just wrong for them. You know, maybe in his mind was, let's help make it easier. But ultimately, what it ended up being, yes. yeah, and and he may have had the wrong intention too. I mean, it may have been that he said, "Yeah, there's a profit we can make here. Let's start doing that." Yeah, you know, that may have very well been what happened. But let's just assume that, just for our discussion, let's just assume that this guy had a good intention, so that their thought was, "We are trying to help people worship." We are trying to make it easier on people to worship. You think he brought all, they brought all the best best into the temple to sell? No. <laughs> got, a, got a little lamp there. Let's go ahead and take it in. Too. Well, and you know people too, when, when you walked up there and you said, how much is that one? And then you go, whoa. Okay, well, what about that one? Okay. Yeah. You really, it's more of a shopping. You're, you're looking, yeah. they've traveled a long way. They're counting their pennies and they're not, it is a sacrifice to even go, but after right. you get there, you know, like, okay, I got five bucks left, you know. <laughs> and, and I've, got, I've got a note there that says it made it especially um, hard for the poor people to actually, to worship. Yeah, it did. It was a hindrance on a lot, and especially, you know, we talk about the Jewish nation so much, but the Gentiles, it was extremely hard for them now. I mean, they're walking in, they're getting taken advantage of. Does this really, is this really the God you want to serve that the supposed representatives of him here on earth, the Jewish religious leaders, priests, that they're taking advantage of everything that I do here? Is this really the religion I want to be connected to? Like you had to be diehard and have a personal relationship with God almost to be a Gentile and want into this. And God says, I'm supposed to be open to all people. So look at the last part of question seven. Should it sometimes be an inconvenience to come to church to worship God? I think so. It, it, it makes you... <clears throat> well, it, it shows if you're determined or not, if you are okay. really true to God or not, if this is something that you really want. Okay. It shows your commitment. Yeah, there you, you go. Have to choose, That's the word I was looking for. You have for. to choose between something that you probably really want to do or to come here to do what you know you're supposed to do. Then yeah, and then you're trying to work it around and it is a big inconvenience. And I think God took it that way because he wants to see if we're truly choosing what we're, we're dedicated. And I think it's the same as I was sitting there thinking when you was talking about the Hosea. We had to do that today and take an animal to sacrifice. And we had raised just out of yard and raised cattle. Would we truly go out there and pick our best one to take that we've nurtured, baby, fattened up all year long, and take it to the slaughter? Or would we say this one looks pretty good? And I mean, honestly, sure. I sit there and think, you know, could I really do that? It would, it would be hard. Mm -hmm. So then, if somebody says, "Well, you don't even have to bring it up here; you can just pick one of mine," well, yeah, I'm kind of like, "Don, yeah, I think the lamb was raised all year and baby eaten things, so yeah, I'll take yours." Yeah. And too, about the inconvenient. Remember back when revivals were a full week long, yep. or longer. Sunday night, and then 
he went a horrible week and it ended Sunday morning getting all this email and it was a deal and what a good guy we might have a weekend revival um, you know have someone come three days at the most yeah and bring it even down that's to that's just too hard <laughs> bring it even down to church or even classes you want yeah. out a certain time there should be no time limit I watched the revival last night. Watch it more well, Karen. Karen. <laughs> I know, but see, there are churches Grandview. that don't have. Yeah. Grandview. They, go till they feel like. Yeah. Of course, I think it just it ends tonight. I think. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot of excuses now. I mean, I, I've been guilty of it in years past, but you know, especially for the week. You know, I'm, I'm tired from work. Mm -hmm. I don't have a church yet. I will go Thursday night, Friday night to the ball game with the same tiredness I had to not come to church. That is, that's to me, that's where you have to make the decision. Yeah. It, you know, to go to God's house and worship, we're supposed to do that. We have ball game and stuff are options. It's almost yeah. like it's our modern day sacrifice. We don't have to drag a lamb, but we got to sacrifice our time. That's what's really needed. Time has become a big sacrifice for people. Opportunity to sacrifice, I should say. Okay, I want you to look around you in the room right now. Not a people. Yeah, not a people in the world. Okay, we have to separate Wesley and Mary in the future. It's just kind of like when we were kids and you have to put them in certain places. Mary's not me. Better buy any bikes from Boston. Look around you in the room. What have we made to be more convenient? What are you sitting on? <laughs> what if you had to stand up for the whole service? Mm. You know, there's there's one of us that stands up for a lot of it. <laughs> Just saying. Yes, he does. <laughs> God. We have lights. I'm not saying they're wrong. Heat and air. Yeah, you let it get two degrees off of where we are comfortable, and what happens? And somebody's texting Doug or calling Doug and saying, can you turn the thermostats on one or the other? Go ahead and say it. We have these nice papers that spread out that we shouldn't even complain about. I, that wasn't even in my mind, but now that you bring it up. <laughs> uh, we have TV screens or screens that you can read. Take notes from, we we've almost made it to where you don't have to bring your Bible because we have Bibles here at the church, or you can read it, or you have your phone. We have a grand piano, we have an organ, we have decor. I mean, it's pretty fancy to me. <laughs> you walk, start walking out the door, we got restrooms that are nice. You get out in the parking lot, parking lot's not chat anymore. So it's okay as long as we don't charge for them, right? <laughs> Went to a church down on when I was a kid growing up on Cash River, right on Cash River. And morning services, Sunday morning, wasn't too bad. But if they had Sunday night services, then mosquitoes would come in off Cash River and you'd have to hang on to something to get to carry it out. I remember over in the old church, wasps would come out of the ceiling. Wasps would come out of the ceiling. My grandma would sit there with a fan and try to get the mosquitoes all over. I went to church where the, we had, had pews, had the seats, but they was homemade seats and the uh, boards there and the, and the bottom was cracked between the boards. Didn't have the pad right there. Now let's, let's move beyond the building because, you know, these are things that, most all of you have it. You have padded seats at home. Like you're not sitting on a log at home, I don't think. If you are, let me know. We'll get you something. But most of you have air, heat in some kind at home. Uh, you have a bathroom at home. Uh, may not have an asphalt driveway, but, but you got a driveway you can get in and out of your house on kind of thing. 
So most of those things are kind of equivalent. But let's talk about what we do to attract people. Do we make it convenient for people to come for the sake of trying to get them here? Now, I know we're, we're at 11 o'clock. If anybody needs to leave, y'all feel free to, to get up and go. I'm going to go for a few more minutes. But if you need to go, don't, don't feel bad about going, anybody. What about... I was going to leave you said that. Was, now that I said you... <laughs> I'm serious about that. I do mean that. I don't want anybody to feel bad. If you need to go, go. Um, kind of the discussion I had before, like the sacrifice of time. Is it hard for us to sacrifice a few hours of sleep for us to get up and go to church? Meddling now, all right. Is it hard for us to say, okay, my kids are going to have to give up something, grandkids, or I'm going to have to give up seeing my grandkids do something in order for me to go to church? Or... <clears throat> got a real busy week don't know that I'm going to be able to get everything done so and tonight it's going to be more convenient for me to stay home and get some stuff done I got to get done by the way it's raining <laughs> alien substance Super Bowl Sunday, there seems to be a few fewer people. It's not the same. Exactly. And you wonder if he'd come back to say he'd come in our service and threw us out because we wasn't being spiritual. How many of us would be tossed out there because we're here but we're sold up or grumpy for being here because we chose to come here but we're not truly here? Are you here but you're making yeah, 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 right here. Here. I mean, how many would you truly be still <laughs> preaching to? Um, somewhere I thought I'd put it on here. Look at question 11. How would Jesus respond to the worship that goes on in our church on any given Sunday? How would he respond to the worship that goes on in our hearts on those days? Like there's probably an element that it... it sh what if it's a little bit hard for us to go to church? Does it mean a little more to us if it is? Do we realize that there's a little more value in it if it is a little bit harder for us to go? <laughs> he said one or the other. <laughs> you see, I hear more of a side of, you know, I don't like calling it a, a inconvenience or like you're giving up something because if you're truly sold out, if you are truly seeking Christ, and, and it does not even cross your mind, like it is an inconvenience. You know, it doesn't mean that, yeah, you're going to miss out on some things, but it should never be like, well, that's an inconvenience, or that's, I'm having to give this.
choose right and not give in to temptation, and sometimes we do. That's why we have to ask Jesus daily for forgiveness. I don't think there's times we let worldly things come into our life and take precedence over where we know we should be. But he's truly right, and that's just something that we should pray to God to lead us daily is to strengthen our desire to want to be there. I mean, there's times I ain't going to lie, I'm going to be completely honest, that I've come into church and my mind's not been where it should be. And I leave here and I have a ton of guilt because I think, I'm sitting here trying to think about what you preached about or what truly I needed to get from that. And I mean, I've felt guilt to the point sometimes I go back and have to re-watch online, which is a great thing, and truly put my mind where it needs to be instead of when it wanders. Right. Yeah, the point of it was um, like they started selling money changing to make it more convenient. If it started with the one guy that said, let's make this easier to get for people to come because some of them are traveling long distances. If it started with that, then they were making it more convenient for them to be there. But convenience turned into what? Sinfulness, because it went the extreme, like you started here. Let's assume that we started with the right intention. Started here, it ended up like way offline, right? If I got this. That Michelle every Sunday started saying, I'm going to give you a Bible, you take it into church, when you leave there will be a basket, you drop it in. That's a convenience, that's a great thing, but if you get in the habit of doing that, are you picking up your Bible any other day of the week? Chase and I kind of had this conversation a week or two ago about uh, from youth. We're making it convenient for them to have a Bible here, but what are they doing after that? Our girls carry theirs. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. And I mean, that's why we bought journaling Bibles, which we have 10 girls of them hand do. So it has like coloring and journaling spaces. And so right. we intrigue them to want to get in there to do something to come back and do <coughs> with what I've done in here. And if yeah. they just spent 30 minutes coloring that, it's a Bible verse. So hopefully it's going to be in their mind by the time they're done. But at least they got in the Bible. You know, you can take that even, and I'm not saying that it is, but I'm just saying you can take that and say, you know, we've made it easier for them to get into the Bible. So, like, where do you stop that, you know? I'm not saying that that's wrong. I know what you're saying. Yeah. The uh, Gentiles weren't required at Passover. Right. So, I mean, they had to want to go. How many of them you think wanted to go to this mess? But you're right. But, but the Jews were required. This was a requirement for right. them. For the Gentiles to show up, it showed more dedication on their part uh, than it, it did, did on the Jews. It did. I don't know if they made the sacrifices or not. They could. There was a provision for them too. I don't know all the details of it. They could. But um, but it was more of a it was more of a want to for them to do it because they were going to be treated terribly when they went there. Yeah. I think we really have to be careful as church as a whole that as we look at ways to try and get people here, like do we make it so convenient that there's really no sacrifice at all that occurs in order to come? And ultimately, yes, we want to get to what Chase talked about, that there is this desire to get there. But in our efforts of trying to get people to come, like, do we make it so easy that there's no sacrifice at all? And so we teach them in the beginning, unintentionally, but we teach them that coming to Jesus is easy. And then what does that lead to? Well, being a Christian must be easy. And then what are they faced with? It's not easy. I've heard Joyce say when she was growing up, her dad was a Methodist preacher. It wasn't a question if you was going to church. Mm -hmm. So I don't guess that ever entered your mind. You you got up Sunday morning, you was going to church. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you know, Jennifer, not today. Uh, there's no and. There's no. Uh, I mean, look. That's good for you, wasn't it? I can, I can, as a preacher's daughter, I can remember being a small child and laying on a quilt and my mother fanning me because it was so hot. And we're talking small country churches. There's not been a day that I can't remember being in church. I know that's not for everybody, but I myself don't know anything any different. So to feel like it's a sacrifice, I don't ever feel that way. Right. You want to be there. You know, that's just where I feel the most comfortable. Now, I know other people do not have that. But I felt like I feel like if we, you ask the question, are we making it too easy for them to come? I'm going to say no, because the church is not full. And I think as you progress in your walk, you'll eventually get closer and closer to what Chase is saying. Right. It's a gradual progression as you grow closer to the Lord and you study His Word and you're trying to truly be what He wants you to be. You'll eventually, it'll gradually occur to where you are here every time the doors are open. You are involved and you are taking advantage of what the church has to offer. And we hope that happens at the moment of salvation, but reality is it may not. Yeah, it's still a maturation process. There's a mature uh, maturing that has to occur. It is. That we have to disciple. Um, <clears throat> I think we can come up with a lot of, of reasons that seem like good reasons to do certain things, and we don't think through what the end result may be of those things. Um, just take the, the Bible, for instance, you know, in, in church, having them here. I can remember years ago when I was a kid that the thought was, let's get some Bibles for the kids that don't bring their Bible. Well, it is a good line of thought because we want them to read the Bible while they're here. But you know what that kind of ended up leading to? Well, why do I have to carry mine? There's one there at church. I remember having this discussion with my mom and dad. As a kid, I remember it. You know, Dad, there's a Bible there in the class I can I can read. You know, why do I need to bring mine? And Dad said, because it's yours and you need to read it. And you need to have the practice of bringing it back and forth and carrying it with you. You know, he, he told me. Um, but do we always take the time to teach those things? Or do we say, you know, it's just easier if the church has one there for them? It's amazing what you hold people accountable to, that it changes the level of what they do, the expectation. But if we don't set the expectation, then it's not there. Now, ultimately, we want to get to where they just do it, and, but we have to train them in that, right? So question eight, Malachi 3, 1 through 3, foretells Jesus cleansing out the temple was it significant that it occurred during the week of Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread? What were people supposed to remove from their homes during this time? So they're supposed to remove yeast. For lack of time, I'm going to go through them kind of quick now. They're supposed to remove yeast. So Jesus, that's during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you remember, prior to the Israelites leaving Egypt, Moses told them, you need to get rid of all your yeast, you need to make unleavened cakes because you're going to have to be ready to go at a moment's notice. So they have this time, Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is remembering that. It's the same time as Passover is occurring because those two happen back to back. But even in this time period that Jesus is living here on earth, they celebrated Feast of Unleavened Bread, which meant they were supposed to remove yeast from their house. Now what does yeast represent throughout the Bible when you compare it to our life? Well, 
Wesley said it. Sin. Sin. Biblically, yeast represents sin because once it has a foothold, it begins growing. So it's the growth of sin is what it kind of represents. So they were supposed to remove yeast or in, in the example, sin from their, their household. Um, is it significant that Jesus cleansed during this time? Like, What was He removing from the house of God? Sin, sin right? Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. And question nine, did Jesus become angry during this time? Was it sin? Did He lose His temper? Was He angry? Yes. Righteous, anger. Righteous anger, yeah. Did He lose His temper? No. He fully knew what he was doing. Uh, was it sin? No. No. Why was it not sin for him to become righteously angry? He was doing what needed to be done. It was something that other people had done against God. He was, you might say, defending his father's house. That's probably not the best terminology to use, but, but he was standing up for truth. And it was, it was righteous. I think I used an example a couple of weeks ago. Like, I can tell you that I love my wife all day long, but if someone is standing there physically slapping her and I don't do anything, am I really loving her? No, I'm not. What I should do is I should become angry about what's going on because I'm defending what God has placed in my care. Does that make sense? Now, it should be a righteous anger, which means I'm not out just to do harm to them to do harm. I'm out to defend my wife. Does that make sense? Difference between the two? All right, question 10. What kind of environment had the people made the worship of God? Carnival. Carnivalistic may be a way to put it. Sinful. Very sinful. Uh, had they made access to God for sale? Do we do that today? Do we make access to God for sale today? No, we're not selling raffle tickets or anything. But... You know, there are, there are churches, though, nowadays. They have some kind of money-making scheme. To, and I don't know if that's right or wrong. To support something. Well, we have an option. Is that the same thing? Do what? So we have an auction. Is that the same thing you're talking about? We have offering booths. Uh, he said we have an auction. Is that the same thing? Like the CTS auction, I think is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Let's use an example of something that you might watch on TV. Something you might see on TV. There are some good TV evangelists. There are some that maybe... Um, you should turn the channel on. <laughs> if you watch a 30 minute, let's say they condense their service down to 30 minutes, and in that 30 minute time, there are three, four commercials or infomercials about donate to this so that we can do this. A new book. Have we made God for sale in doing that? Now sometimes it's hidden behind the disguise of we can reach more people if you do this. Um, I'm not saying that, that churches that put out there that the opportunity to donate, I'm not saying that that's wrong in some cases, okay? What I'm saying is we have to look at the intent of what's going on. And if they're more interested in that than they are about sharing with you Jesus Christ, Gave them a sheet of paper showing how much they had been assessed for to give to the church each week. <laughs> they had been assessed. 
Really? That's only two times there ever went. <laughs> Anybody want to be a church assessor? <laughs> We're not going to have one. Just uh, kind of like the money train. That'd be kind of like the money train. That's kind of common in some denominations that they when what they expect. There are some denominations that do that. Um, we have to be careful that we don't become and and it's easy for us to look at what was going on in the temple and say, "Man, that's completely wrong." It's hard for us to see what we're doing and evaluate sometimes. Are we presenting things in the correct way? And we have to think through what we've seen here. We have to think through what we're doing. Our intentions can start good, but they can end up wrong. And so we have to constantly evaluate what we're doing and make sure that what we're doing, even though our intention with it was good, that what we're doing is actually right and good. And that's sometimes hard to do. It is. All right, um, so question 11, we've talked about a little bit. How would Jesus respond to the worship that goes on in our church on any given Sunday? And how would he respond to the worship that goes on in our hearts on those days? Not really interested in you answering them out loud. If you want to share with me something about the worship of our church, if you feel like there's something that is could be changed or could be better, I would appreciate that. But the individual one... You know, how would Christ respond to the worship that goes on in our hearts? I think that's something we have to ask almost every day. Because it I'm asking this more from the standpoint of like Sunday and Wednesday when we come to church, but at the same time, every day that we get up, there should be a worshipfulness about our life. So maybe every day we need to ask ourselves that question. And then question twelve, notice the question proposed to Jesus in verse eighteen. Verse 18 says, So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Why were they seeking a sign? And are we sign seekers today? Was there an ultimate sign that was given? Why were they seeking a sign? Seems like that plagued him throughout his time, right? He was always being asked by Jewish people, What sign do you show? What sign do you give? Why were they seeking a sign? Kind of like the old Missouri slogan, show me state, show me. Any other thoughts about why they were seeking a sign? Most of them were from religious leaders and they wanted to be right. Okay. They wanted to be right, yeah. They wanted to be sure of what they were. Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah. But he was going against them. And they were like, they'll, they'll prove it. Yeah. So he wanted evidence. There's stories in the Old, Old Testament where they would, I forget what you call it, when they would um, in, in essence ask for a sign. And Divination? Oh, yeah. If they would, yeah. they would ask God to do that for them. Gideon and his fleece. Uh, yes, yes, a fleece. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so sometimes they, I'm sure, have heard those stories that they could get a sign. You know, it's interesting because it was, Gideon was asking for something specific, yes. right? Yeah. So when you look at, at what these guys were asking for, they're saying, show us a sign that you're the Son of God. Had they been given a sign? The Old Testament was, yeah. So really what they had to do is just look and evaluate, right? Like, is he fulfilling this? I think they were kind of saying, you know, they'd seen these miracles. It says there that they'd seen the miracles that Jesus had done. And, okay, this is what's going on now. Give us a sign. What's to come? What's next? Mm -hmm. You know, you would think that being born of a virgin would be a pretty good sign that something special about this guy, right? Especially when it's prophesied in Isaiah. Are we sign seekers today? Yes. Some of us are. 
to a certain point. I mean, you have to have belief without a sign. That's what faith is. Mm -hmm. You have to have faith. But so many, if it's a really important decision, you really, you really want some kind of a sign to know you're going in the right direction. And that's probably just the human in us sometimes. But. What about for faith in God? So let's let's move it. Let's kind of set aside like. Kind of, if you go back to Gideon, he was asking for something. Like God was kind of telling him to do. He wanted to make sure he was right. He asked for a sign to just show that. It's a decision in his personal life, so to speak. What about just faith in Christ? Do we look for signs to actually believe in God? Most of you here, probably all of, all of you here, I assume are believers. So you've made that decision at some point in your life. But if you can think back, like, did you look for something that gave you evidence that I should believe in Christ? A sign of some kind? I don't know. I never did believe in a big, big bang theory. I mean, I, you look around the world and you think, no way that happened. Okay. No way this came about by that. Yeah. So there's got to be something else. There's got to be. What was standing right in front of them that was the sign? I mean, he himself was it, right? Like, we've already been given a sign. So when we say, are we sign seekers? Like, sometimes we take that the wrong way. Like, really, we should look, what is the sign that was given by God? And it was Jesus Christ. You know, and so we should, not, sorry, but we should seek that sign. But when we start going outside of that and saying, God, give me some other sign that I should believe in the sign you've already given me. Then we're getting to where, like, we're not really trusting in God at this point because he's already given us the answer. Didn't Jesus tell us to look at the heavens mm -hmm. for his second coming? Right. The way things change. What's he had? I, I don't look for things, but when I read things about archaeological finds or whatever that confirm, sure. that, that helps me. Those are confirmations, yeah. I um, had a conversation with, with someone yesterday, and over the last year had some significant things happen in her life. Um, she can look back right now and say, God was working a year ago to prepare me for what was going to happen, and I see it now. Um, those are, you know, those are confirmations, I want to say, that God is, is working in your life. And those are important. I think we should identify those because they are faith builders. Uh, question 13, what effect did Jesus' statement, destroy the temple and in three days I will raise it up, have on the people that were present that day? How many groups of people were there? What effect does Jesus' words have today? What did people believe Jesus to be at that time? What about today? It is a lot of questions in one, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. So what effect did destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up? What effect did that have on the people that day? I, don't, I think they, they were thinking the temple temple, not him, right? Mm -hmm. so, confused. Confused. Scoffers. Scoffers. Like, there's no way you can do that. Yeah. So there's some, some, that, believed him. some that may have believed him. Some it may have angered. It wasn't even completed yet. It, well, that's true. Yeah, they were still actually working on it. 46 years, and the Romans, right, 70 AD, they, they destroyed it. Yeah, which was, by the way, was the ultimate, like they wouldn't listen to Jesus standing there, so the ultimate sign was, I'm going to take away the place that you actually worship. God was working through the Romans to actually still try and point them to Christ. We, I lose sight of that sometimes when I think about it. That's right. And One will stand south, up. Southwest corner of the temple, I'll never forget this. When we were there, take one of these pews and then square it off in one big square. Probably like, yeah, yeah like he has one solid stone at the base of the temple. Don't even think of it. The archaeologists put down the bedrock. One solid stone, like as long as this pew, think of the manner. And what are you, nuts? You're going to tear it you're, in three days? Yeah. You know, it, that stuck out to, to us. Yeah. One stone, and you had like four of them before. It was different types of layers because it was torn down, rebuilt with whatever's left over. Right. 
So <clears throat> there were people that were confused, people that were angry even. Maybe some that, uh, Wesley brought up, maybe some that believed. Probably it would have been hard for them because if they were thinking physically, it would have been hard for them to believe. Well, he's got ha at least half of his apostles are with him at this point. And, you know, there's a statement made there by John that says, uh, what does it say? Maybe it was. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. But it was kind of, John was writing in hindsight some of this as well. And they were probably intrigued and could have had some thought about. Maybe this guy is a real deal, you know? And maybe started the whole process of belief. But we know faith grows, right? So when somebody makes a bold statement today, I mean, that intrigues me. I'm gonna follow that guy and see Research it anyway, yeah. Story. See more Same about problem. it. How many groups of people were there? We talk about this kind of often. Okay, in terms of in relation to Jesus, how many groups of people were there? Believers and non-believers, non and then there's a third group. Kind of the people you just talked about. They're intrigued. They don't really know whether to believe. They don't really think they don't believe, but they don't really know. So they're, they're just kind of following to see if they're going to believe or not. So you kind of have three groups of people that are always around Christ. Um, what effects did Jesus' words have that day? That day, the effect was it created confusion. It created some that wanted to see what was going on. And it created some that it just turned away completely. Now, I think I brought this up in a sermon, but could you imagine if they would have went and started tearing the thing down? Like if the religious leaders would have said, okay, whatever they're saying, like, prove it to us. Proof's in the, what do they say? Proof's in the pudding. Proof's in the pudding. We're going to go tear this thing down, and then you build it back in three days. Show us you can do it. What do you think would have happened if they would have done that? First off, they would have had an uprising from the Jewish culture, because they would not have stood for that, right? Secondly, they didn't have enough faith to do that. Like, ultimately, if they would have had, like, true faith, and they... If they were thinking from a physical perspective and they thought, I really want to see if this guy can do this, then they would have went and started tearing it down to see if he could have built it back. Now, it would have took them probably 46 years to tear it down, or it would have taken them a period of time to tear it down. But they would have took some action to that. Ultimately, what they did is they just said, oh, you can't do it. Like There was no... They weren't going to let him prove it to them. Were they? they weren't going to, but they were also they weren't inquiring about, is he really right? You know, can he really do this? Of course, we know, and John points it out, he's talking from a spiritual standpoint. He's not talking from the physical. And we know that three days represents his time that was in, he was in the tomb, right? And he, and he rebuilt. So let's think about what Jesus' words, because we know what effect they had then, that day. What effect did Jesus' words have today? You share Jesus' words with people today, and what effect does it have? Are there some that just says, hi? I know it's stuff's written, but I don't believe in it. You got some that's curious, some of them's going to believe, and some of them are just. Yeah. Should we think that there's different groups of people than what there was then? Yeah. Like, should we think that every time we go out and we share Jesus' words, that people are just automatically going to believe? Do we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking they should, though? Like, we want that, right? We want it, and we go out, and sometimes we're disappointed because it doesn't happen. But we have to realize that there are times that we're going to share and we're going to get rejected. And Christ even speaks of that. And he tells his apostles that. He tells them, shake off the dust from your feet when you go out. You know, And he told them that for our benefit as well, that there are going to be people that reject you. And when, it, when they do, it's not on you. And that's what he was telling the apostles. It's not on you. It's on them. Like they've chose their destiny, if you want to call it that. They've chose, they've made their decision. It's on them now. 
Um, so today, we have to realize when we go out, there's going to be people that are not going to listen. There's going to be people that are going to be intrigued, but they're not going to make a decision at that moment in time. Now, lack of decision is a decision, but for them, in their mind, they're not really saying, I'm going to believe or I'm not going to believe. They're just trying to still figure out, so to speak. Now, if Christ returned at that moment in time, they hadn't made a choice to believe, then that is a decision. That's a bad one. But So, in that in that time that we go and we start sharing, we got to realize all of this is going to happen the same way that it did then. There's nothing new under the sun. There are people that believe, there's people that don't, there's people that are intrigued. And somehow we got to still go out there, not become discouraged by it, share it, realize that there are some people that may reject us right now or just inquire, but eventually they may believe. The apostles were some of them. They struggled with it at times. But eventually, as John writes, and I think it's so important what we see there in verse 22. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now you can interpret that two ways. Was John writing from hindsight and saying, after he was raised from the dead, we remembered everything and we believed? Or was he saying, we believed, but we just remembered all this stuff? I tend to think that their rock-solid belief did not come until after he was raised from the dead. And so I think it's so significant that John writes this because he's saying, we followed him those three years, and yeah, we said we believed, but we didn't really believe until after. Now, we can talk about that that's maybe spiritual growth. We can, you know, when was their moment of salvation? Well, you know, did salvation really, was it even possible until he died on the cross? I don't know. You can get into that debate. But at the same time, John is saying, we remembered this stuff, we saw the signs, and we believed when he resurrected. The ultimate sign was Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And we have to remember that and share that as well. Let me pray and we'll go. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, for your goodness to us, your mercy.